Well, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Blueprint Church. Um, man, this is such an amazing reality that we are celebrating today. This is Resurrection Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate that our God is not dead. Our Savior, He lives. He has shattered the grave. The tomb that once held His body is empty, right? He is alive. He's alive. And you know, this is not the only time of the year that we celebrate His resurrection. We actually celebrate His resurrection every Sunday. And so if you are here for the first time, and listen, I'm glad that you're here, but if you're here for the first time because you're like, all right, it's, it's Resurrection Sunday, I need to come to church and celebrate this, actually, you can come every Sunday. Every Sunday we are celebrating this. Every Sunday, Jesus is alive. In fact, listen, listen, here's another one. Every day, Jesus is alive in you. He's in you. He's alive in you. And so first, I want to welcome all of you who are here today. If you are here worshiping with us for the first time, again, thank you for choosing to celebrate with us today. Or maybe if you are a returning guest of Blueprint, thank you for coming. For those who came with families and friends, thank you for inviting them to come. My name is Carly, and I serve as the pastor here alongside of Dehadi uh, Lewis, who's the founding pastor here. And so we are so grateful um, to be able to serve in this role. Uh, I just want you to know here at Blueprint, we believe that the gospel changed people and people changed the world. And this is the reason why we preach the gospel every single Sunday, because the gospel is what enables us to live this resurrected life. And with that life, we go out into the world and we change the life. We change, we change the world, the world around us with the gospel message of Jesus. And we celebrate that every single Sunday. I want you to know if you, again, if you're a guest or if you're a returning guest, you are always welcome here at Blueprint. You're always welcome here at Blueprint. And which we want you to know that you can always feel comfortable to come here at Blueprint just as you are because we have a God who invites us to come to him just as we are. But then we also have a gospel who will always challenge us to change. And we are unashamed to preach this gospel that changes our lives. So yes, you are welcome to come just as you are, but the gospel will challenge us to live a godly life. And we preach the gospel message of Jesus here. And so at the end of service, listen, two things I want you to do. One, there are some gifts in the back if you are new. Please go in the back and grab a gift. This is a way of us saying thank you for, you, uh, for coming. And then um, if you live in the area and you're looking for a church to go to, you can fill out a connect card so that we can connect with you and um, give you some information about who we are as a church. But then not just that, um, many ways that you can get connected with this church because we have groups and we call them city groups around the community, around the area of Atlanta where you can plug in with other believers and worship throughout the week. So it's not just on Sundays, but throughout the week you can worship. And so I'm excited about today as well. Um, we're also going to celebrate the resurrection through seeing a, 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 a illustration of what happened spiritually in the lives of some people. We're going to see this happen here with baptism. And when we get baptized, this is a picture, a spiritual symbol of what Jesus has done in our lives, that these people who are going to profess their faith in Jesus, the reality of what Jesus has done in their life, they're going to be doing that through baptism. And you know what? I want to make an invitation to you to be baptized. And not today, of course, all right? But if you've never been baptized, if you've been following Jesus and you've never been baptized, I want to invite you to do that because that is a command from the Lord. But then that's an opportunity to celebrate the gospel in your life, right? And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into our text for today. Uh, today we're taking a quick break from our study in Galatians. So we've been studying the book of Galatians now for the past couple weeks, uh, but right now in light of the fact that it is Resurrection Sunday, we're going to uh, spend some time looking at uh, Mark chapter 8. So let me go ahead and pray with you, and then we can dive into that. Father, thank you again. Thank you again for your resurrected power that lives in us. That you did not face defeat. Unlike 
others who are following a dead savior, whether it's Muhammad, or whether it's Joseph Smith, or whether it's Buddha, whoever it may be, those leaders face defeat. But our God reigns victoriously. Our Savior reigns victoriously. That he tasted death, but he conquered death. He rose on the cross. He rose from the cross. He rose from his tomb. And now he lives victoriously, sitting right next to the Father in heaven, reigning victoriously. In that same power, that resurrected power lives in us. You have changed our lives through the resurrection. You have set us free through the resurrection. The sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice was accepted in your resurrection. And we no longer have to work to earn our salvation. You have accomplished that for us. Thank you. And that is what we get to celebrate. Lord, I pray at the end of today for anyone who is here who do not know this power. I pray today they would experience it. Or if there's anyone here who have forgotten that power and who have allowed the enemy to lie to them, to make them think that they are weak and that they are forever in bondage and sin, I pray that they would remember that they are powerful in Christ because of this resurrection. Lord, I pray that you would be with me. Anoint every word. May your word come alive. May you speak truth. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And today I want to talk about how the resurrection calls us to a greater life. The resurrection calls us to a greater life, a life greater, far better than the life that we are living now. Listen, we all want a better life, right? We all want a better life. The desire for a better life is at the heart of all human beings. And listen, it doesn't matter what kind of upbringing you had, whether you came from a stable environment or an unstable environment, every single one of us have something about our lives that we want to make better or change or improve, right? And this is the reason why many of us are so driven to set goals or work hard to be successful because we want a better quality of life. Or maybe you as a parent, you want a better quality of life for your kids. And wanting a better life may show up in different ways for different people. And so a better life for some may look like having a successful job, right? And so we go to school, We study hard, we take exams, right? We rack up a lot of debt, we get that degree just so we can have that job to give us a better life. And even if you didn't go to school and you went the entrepreneur route, you're still working hard to be successful and you're overcoming challenges or chasing opportunities because a better life to you means success. Some of us, a better life means having a family. For some of us, we wanna get married. We wanna have kids. We wanna build a strong and healthy family unit that loves God or uh, loves one another and support one another. And so what happens is we invest our time and we pursue different opportunities to sacrifice for our family because a better life means family, right? A better life 
is what we want to give to our family. It means joy and fulfillment. Others may see a better life as having a healthy relationship. And so, for some, a better life means not being single, or we don't want to be alone. We want to have meaningful relationships. We want to be loved by others. We want to be accepted. And so, a better life is finding a place where we belong or where we feel accepted. And then listen, others may see a better life as having nicer quality of things, right? You want a better house or a better car, or at least a car that actually drives and is just reliable, right? Or maybe you just want to travel the world. But then, you know, some may see a better life as just, I just want peace of mind. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't need any of those things, but I just want peace. I don't want to have to worry. I don't want to have to battle depression or anxiety or guilt or shame. Or I just want to be healthy. I'm struggling with chronic illness or whatever that illness is. I just want to be healthy. Or maybe you want to be physically fit and have that, you know, summer body, right? Or maybe you want to be mentally fit, right? Or emotionally stable. We all have something about our lives that we want to make better. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a better life because that's a natural desire. In fact, it would probably be a problem if you didn't want to improve or better. But what if I told you that in the resurrection, in Christ, we can have the best quality of life? What if I were to tell you that in Christ, you can have a quality of life that is better than relationships, that is better than advancing in your career, that is better than physical health, that is better than wealth, that is better than pursuing after your goals? What if I were to tell you that in Christ, you can have a quality of life that is much better? And so today, I want to take some time to look at Mark chapter 8. And so in Mark chapter 8, I think Jesus is going to show us that there's a better quality of life that he has to offer to us, but the question is, do we want that type of life? Or are we satisfied with the type of life that we have now? All right? And so this is what we're going to see in Mark chapter 8, this invitation to a better quality of life. And so in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38, it says this, then he, ga- he began to teach them that it is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and to rise after three days. He spoke openly about this, and Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke him. But then turning around, and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get, be, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concern, but human concern. And calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit or benefit someone to gain the whole world and loses his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me, he says, and my word, and this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father and the holy angels. So when you read these verses, it sounds a little counterproductive to say that in the resurrection or in Christ, we are offered a better quality of life. When the things that are mentioned in this passage doesn't seem so convincing, right? It doesn't seem so appealing or attractive. Because I want you to see this. In verses 
31, when Jesus talks about his own life, what his life will look like, in verses 31, Jesus says, one, it is necessary, right? It's necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things. And then he goes on to say, after it's necessary, it, the Son of Man will be rejected by elders. And then the Son of Man will be killed. And so Jesus says, when it comes to his own life, it's necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things. And so Jesus tells us, in his own life, it is a crucial component not optional. It's necessary. It's unavoidable. It's an unavoidable reality for him to experience pain, suffering, in this life. And one thing about Jesus is that he will never sell us into a life that is not true. Jesus will never sell you into a life that is not true. Jesus is not that salesman who comes to you and promises you a whole bunch of things, and then when you commit to it, you realize you bought into a lie. Jesus will never sell you into a life that isn't true. He will always be honest to speak the truth, even when it may be difficult to accept or difficult to understand. And that's why in verse 31... It says that he spoke openly about this. Openly about this. Jesus didn't sugarcoat or hide the truth, the reality of his suffering or rejection or his pain or the sacrifice that he would have to endure or even his death. He spoke openly about this. And so from the very beginning of his ministry, it says that he began to teach this to people. Very early in Jesus' ministry, if you go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 1, we see that 4,000 people were following after Jesus. Can you imagine that? 4,000 people were following after Jesus, right? So, for example, today, a lot of churches are launching their first service. A lot of church plants are starting service today. And just imagine if on the first day, 4,000 people come through the doors. That's amazing. That's amazing. But from the very beginning, though, from the very beginning in chapter 8, we see 4,000 people are signing up for Jesus' ministry. But then the very first sermon, we see that Jesus here, that Mark highlights, the very first sermon that we see that Jesus is preaching is about suffering and rejection and pain, and sacrifice, and death, and how this is an unavoidable reality, not optional, but necessary. I'm pretty sure church plant schools, if that really exists, would not encourage preachers to preach that sermon on the very first day, if you want people to come back. And so we see 4,000 people following Jesus, and this is the message that he is preaching. But then we see in the beginning of this section, these 4,000 people were following him because he fed them, he gave them bread, he gave them fish until they were full. He was meeting their physical needs. He was healing them and doing miracles. They're following Jesus because he was enhancing something that was missing in their life. Jesus was serving them, answering their prayers and meeting their needs and blessing their plants and giving them what they want and when they want. And that's the Jesus that these people were attracted to. But then when Jesus started teaching something that was a little different from their expectations. When his teaching took a turn, instead of continuing to focus on meeting physical needs and performing miracles, Jesus began to teach about suffering, rejection, and being killed. 
that's not attractive. And that's why in verse 31, it says that Peter took him aside. Peter took him aside to rebuke him. Peter took Jesus aside to rebuke Jesus. Could you imagine that? So in verse 33, it tells us that Jesus said to Peter, your focus is on human concern, but it's not on God's concern. You do not have the mind of God. So Peter is concerned about human concern, but then we see Jesus is now about to unfold to him, what is God's concern? The thing is, Peter was thinking that Jesus came and he followed Jesus, he committed to Jesus, because Jesus would be this powerful king who would destroy his enemies, establish a kingdom so that he can have a part in this kingdom, so that he can have a seat at the table and probably share in that prestige. Peter was thinking that Jesus would bring comfort or power or status, fix his problems or even wealth. And that's why Peter resisted and rejected any idea that challenged or contradicted his desire because what Peter really wanted was an earthly king. And this is what we do. This is what we do. Whenever Jesus does not meet our temporal expectation or our temporal desires, whenever those things don't align, we rebuke him. We push back and we resist. Because deep down inside, we are more committed to following the Jesus of our own creation, not the biblical Jesus. We want to follow a version of Jesus that's comfortable. We want to follow a version of Jesus that fits our preferences and our biases and our desires. Instead of embracing the true Jesus, the one who challenges our preferences and challenges our biases and our desires, the one who calls us to self-denial and sacrifice, the one who may call us to live a life where we may be very uncomfortable. This is not what Peter wanted. He rebuked Jesus. This message that Jesus was preaching did not agree with Peter. And Peter was probably embarrassed to commit to follow this Jesus who I thought would be king, but now he's talking about suffering. Maybe he was embarrassed or ashamed. And so Peter rebukes Jesus. Now, I hope you can relate to Peter and see Peter's humanity here because many of us have been following Jesus and the same circumstances in our lives don't look any better. You've been following Jesus, and there's still some problems. You've been following Jesus, or maybe you committed to Jesus, but then you still have some struggles. You still have some health struggles. You've been following Jesus, and then your life is still kind of chaotic. And the assumption that the world has of Christian is, if we are following Jesus, then we shouldn't have any problems. And then when we face problems, then the world asks, where's your Jesus? Where's your Jesus? Where's your king? I thought he would come and fix your problems. And, but why are you still suffering? Why are you still being rejected? And why are some of you being killed? I thought your Jesus would provide you a better quality of life. Where's your Jesus? And you can see how this was conflicting with Peter. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, Satan is behind your thinking. There's a thinking that is focused on God's concern, and there's a thinking that is focused on human concerns. And Satan is behind your thinking. Because can you imagine the audacity of a fisherman, an infinite 
person rebuking God in the flesh to correct him as if he knew better. Can you imagine that? I hope you can see Peter's humanity and you can see yourself in Peter because we sometimes do that where we believe that we know better than God. We sometimes believe that our expectations and our plans and our desires or our goals are better than what God has prepared for us. And so what we do is we hold tightly to those expectations. We hold tightly to those desires because we believe that our ways are better. And when God's plan doesn't seem to align with our plans or the type of life that we expect from God doesn't come, we're disappointed and we're ashamed and we rebuke him. We resist him. We push him away and we feel like we need to coach God or we need to defend God. Or maybe, here's the thing, maybe the reality is we just haven't truly surrendered to the biblical Jesus. Maybe the reality is we truly haven't embraced the true Jesus of the Bible and embraced God's understanding and vision for our lives and that his vision for our lives is better. Because listen, just, just play this game with me. Just imagine that God is wise. Just imagine that in his wisdom, he was able to create all of universe out of nothing. Just imagine that this is the God that we serve. Why would we think that he doesn't know better? Just imagine that the same God cares more for us than we care for ourselves, loves us more than we love ourselves because he created us. He knows our worth and value more than we know that for ourselves. Would that change the way that you see him work in your life? Just imagine that this is the God that has a plan for us would we still feel the need to have to correct him and coach him and rebuke him about what our lives should look like? Or should this bring us peace? Should this bring us peace to surrender to his will knowing that he sees the bigger picture and he's working out a plan far greater and better than anything that we could ever imagine? Right? And so what Jesus wanted to show Peter is that Peter did not have the same mindset because Jesus' mindset was to save Peter. Not save Peter from like temporal things, but what he wanted to save Peter from was a greater problem. What Jesus wanted to give to Peter was a greater quality of life not to enhance his life with temporal material things that exempts him from suffering and pain and problem, but exempt him from a God problem. What Peter had was a God problem, a spiritual problem. And this is what God wanted to save him from. It's a God problem that we have that's affecting our quality of life. And this God problem stems from our separation from God because of our sins. And so what sin does, sin creates a barrier between us and God, disrupting our relationship with him and hindering, him, hindering us from experiencing that type of life that God wants from us. And so what sin does, sin creates this barrier where, listen, yes, you can work hard. You can work hard and have the best job and the best family and the best relationship and have the summer bod if you want, right? And yes, you can have all these things, but you'll still be empty. You still won't have joy. You still won't have peace. You still will have guilt. You still will have unrest in your soul. No purpose, no fulfillment, no meaning. You can have everything 
and it still be unsatisfying and mean nothing because ultimately all those things will be gone. And so this is why we see in verse 34, Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, carry his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to be saved or wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Peter was missing the bigger picture about what Jesus wanted to do. You see here, Jesus was predicting his death. Even here where it says, Jesus says, I will rise again in three days. That yes, I will suffer. Yes, I will be rejected. And yes, I will die. And this is all necessary. But in three days, I will rise again. Right? And listen, although this was right in front of Peter's, Peter's face, Jesus said this very openly and clearly to Peter. And not just that, but all throughout the Old Testament, it was right in front of our eyes, in our face, that Jesus' mission was to suffer and was to be rejected and was to die so that Peter would not have to suffer an eternal suffering. That Jesus will suffer for Peter so Peter would not have to suffer an eternal suffering. That Jesus will be rejected for Peter so that Peter would not be rejected by God. That Jesus will die for Peter so that Peter will live. And not only that, but in three days Jesus will rise again. So that in Christ Peter will have a new life. Peter was concerned about human things, but not God's concern. And so would Peter, in the resurrection, see this new life? It's greater and it's better. It's a better quality of life. And this is what Jesus wanted to show to him. And this is what the resurrection does. The resurrection solves our deepest problem not our superficial problems. In the resurrection, Jesus conquered our greatest enemy, which is Satan. In the resurrection, Jesus provided for our needs, not our physical needs, but the perfect sacrifice. In the resurrection, Jesus healed our greatest sickness, sin. In the resurrection, God gave us a better quality of life where we are born again, forgiven, and made new. In the resurrection, we have peace with God. And now, peace with God forever. What is the price tag of that type of life? What is the price tag of that type of life, life beyond the grave? What would you spend to experience that type of life, where our deepest longings are satisfied, where we get to experience the deepest kind of love, the deepest kind of joy, the deepest kind of peace, where every moment is filled with God's presence. What is the price tag on that life? And so when we look at verse 34, Jesus tells us what that price is. Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow after me, right? If anyone wants to follow after me, he must deny himself. Reject himself. Take up the cross. Be prepared to let go and suffer loss of even your own personal desires and follow me and just like me die to self he says this is the price tag for this life and then you go on and you see jesus says what benefit to gain the whole world you gain the whole world but then you lose your life 
You could be very successful, gain the whole world. You could make a lot of money, travel the world, have the very best things in life, marry the most handsome and beautiful spouse, raise the most amazing kids. You can have everything that you set your mind to, to accomplish. And then you die and realize that this part of your life was spent chasing after nothing. I, I, want, I want to show you an illustration for a second. I want you to think about this rope as a picture of your life, a timeline of your life. And this is what Jesus is saying. What is the profit that you would gain the whole world, you pursue after everything that you want, and just imagine that this is the timeline of your life, right? That you do all that you want, all that you realize. You are successful, you have all the money, but then when you die, you realize that this was actually your life. You, for, you're born here, and maybe you spend your entire life pursuing after education or whatever that may be, and then by the time you're like 30, you realize, oh, now I get to live my life, if you make it to 30. And then by 30, you start saving some money and then so that you can retire by 50. And by 50, this is when you feel like, oh, you know what, man, I'm about to live my life. I got no kids, my kids are gone. I have my empty nester, so I can start traveling with my wife. And I, sa I start saving, I have some retirement fund. And then this is where you feel like, man, I am living my life. If you get there, if you get to 50, because some, don't even make it past 20. Some don't even make it past 30. If you get there to say that this is where I get to live up my life, and Jesus says, what if you were able to live it up, but then you die and you realize there's more left to live because there's eternity left. And Jesus says, what is the price tag? Would you be willing to exchange this moment in time in your life to live your best life, what you think is your best life, in exchange for this? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? And so many of us are living our lives and we're spending our time and we are so invested with this moment in time we are holding it so tightly. We don't want to let it go. And Jesus is asking for this moment in time in exchange for eternity. But we want to hold on to it and not let it go. And then when we die, we realize all that we were doing is holding on to something that eventually will be gone and we have nothing to show for it. And so when Jesus says, for what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world, but then lose their soul? And the answer should be, doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. And then we get to verse 38. And this is the question that we see. Jesus asking, whose praises are you living for? He says in verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous generation, the son of man will be ashamed of him. Whose praises are we living for? 
Will you be ashamed to live for him today? Will you be ashamed to give your life to him today? Will you be so fixated on what you have now that you call the best quality of life and reject the greater life that he has to offer you now? And Jesus says, those who are ashamed of me now, I'll be ashamed of them when he comes in glory of the Father. So we see that in his resurrection, Jesus offers us an amazing life. An amazing life. A new life. A better life. And it's a life that is not free from suffering. It's a life that's not exempt from pain. It's not exempt from sickness, that you won't have issues or problems, but it's a life where our greatest problems are taken care of, and that is our God problem, our spiritual problem. And God is the one who gives us greater joy and greater fulfillment and greater purpose than anything else. Like, are you willing to live for this moment? in exchange for this moment? And this is the question that Jesus is asking. And this is the question that I am asking to you and offering to you today on this resurrection day. Will you continue to pursue this life, not even this, this life moment in time, and try to save it? Or will you see the greater picture that God has a much better life to offer you. And that starts now with him through the resurrection. Okay. So I wanna make a couple invitations to you. Some of you are here today, again, this could be your very first time in church. You're like, you know what, I'm just gonna go to church, maybe. Man, my parents are here. I'm just going to go with them. And praise God you're here anyway. But I want to make this invitation to you that if you don't know who Jesus is, Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he died on the cross to prove that to you. Dying on, your, on the cross means that he took all of your shame so that you don't have to walk in shame anymore. All of your sins so that you don't have to deal with that anymore, the consequence of your sins. He took all that for you, so now you no longer have to work to earn it. And it's a free gift that he has to give to you. And so all this that you're doing, the religious stuff that you're doing, coming to church, making, being a good person, all those things are good, but that is not what gets you into right relationship with God. What gets you into a right relationship with God is the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And he has done that for you. So you no longer have to try on your own. And But not only that, but he has a better life to offer you that believe that Jesus could transform your life and all the struggles that you feel like you can't overcome. There is power. The Bible says the same resurrected power that rose Christ from the dead is living in those who believe. If God could raise Christ from the dead, there's nothing in your life that is impossible for God not to be able to do or give you victory over. And so I want to make that invitation to you if you don't know Jesus to begin that journey for the first time. I also want to make another invitation for those, maybe you've been coming to church for a while and you know a lot about Jesus. Maybe you have given your life to Jesus at some point in time, but then a lot has happened in your life where you've lost the passion that you once had for Jesus. 
you used to have a fire for Jesus. But then now your heart seems very cold towards God. And you want to press that hard reset button. Right? Just that hard reset button just to start all over again. And today is the day for you to do that. I want to encourage you, if you are that person, today is the day to make that commitment and say, you know what, Lord, today I'm going to recommit my life to you. Or, you know, maybe you are here too, that you've been coming to church for a while and you know a lot about Jesus, but then you know what, you probably don't really know Jesus. Because that could be very deceptive that you have a lot of information about Jesus, but don't know Jesus intimately. I want to share with you, like, I grew up in the church. All my life I went to church when my parents brought me to church. Every sun Sunday I was in church. Every Monday we were at some type of fasting, it, like, stuff at the church. And then Tuesday we were at somebody's house for Bible study. And Wednesday we were at the church for Bible study. And Thursday we were at another Bible study. And then Friday, maybe like choir rehearsal for the youth, and then Saturday we're evangelizing, and then Sunday we're back at church again. But I did not know Jesus. I did all those things, but I did not know Jesus. But then it was one day, I think I've shared this testimony with someone before here. I was doing those evangelism on Saturday, and then someone asked me, like, do you really believe what you're saying? And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, I knew the right things to say. I knew the right things to do. I wasn't a bad kid. I just didn't know Jesus. And it reminded me of Jesus saying to those people who came to him, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do all these great things in your name? Didn't I do these work for you? And Jesus says, I, I, I never knew you. Not that I knew you once, but I never knew you. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. That you can know a lot about Jesus, but don't know Jesus at all. And so I want to make that invitation to you. That for those of you who just have a concept of Jesus, but not know him intimately, today would be that day that you would make that change. So I'm going to pray and then make that invitation for you. I don't have to get up. You can stay in your seat and give you some time to let the Lord work in your heart. And then I'll come and pray for you. And again, if you are here and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, and you're wondering, like, what do I do? How do I do that? Um, I'm going to pray, and then you can slip your hand up, and then I'll pray for you, and I can help you lead you in that prayer. But then we also have leaders here that can uh, meet with you. We have some of our elders here and pastors here that can pray with you and then help you um, uh, 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 begin that journey with Jesus. And so... We can help you with that. And so I don't want you to leave today and miss out on this amazing opportunity that Jesus has offered to you to have a better life. Not a life where he meets all of your temporal needs, but a life where he meets your greatest problems, your spiritual problem, and forever fulfill that need. So as we pray...